Hello, this is Rupinder Syal and welcome again to Spartan Tutorials. Today we are going to talk about screening of genomic and cDNA libraries. In our earlier videos, we talked about construction of cDNA libraries and construction of genomic DNA libraries separately. Today we are going to screen them. Okay, so let's go about screening our libraries. Alright, so you have made your cDNA libraries or genomic DNA libraries in whatever vector you want. Here you have your phage DNA phage vectors and here you have your plasmid vectors. Based on whatever vector you have, you have your libraries and you have thousands and thousands, probably millions of these clones, right, depending upon the insert size. And where is your gene of interest that you're looking at, right? That's the big problem. That's the big fishing problem, okay? So that's the one that we are dealing with. So here is your plasmid library. With several hundreds of different clones. And here is your plaque library, right? Okay, which one contains your gene of interest? Right? and which one of them are just you know not useful to you so that's the problem here and how many do you need to screen okay so how many clones do we need to screen this is actually a very good mathematical question and this gives us an idea of the scale of the problem and this problem was addressed by Lewis Clark and John Carbon back in 1976 where they looked at you know uh, plasmid screening and they devised an equation which looks like this this is capital N, which stands for number of clones that you need to screen, equals, this is the formula, natural log of 1 minus P. P stands for what is the probability that you want that your gene of interest or your clone will be identified. So if you want 95% probability or 96 or 99% probability, of course you can't have 100% probability, but 99% is good enough. Okay divided by natural log of 1 minus 1 upon small n. Small n is the number of clones that you originally have based on the insert size. Okay, so for example, we have two examples here. For 95% accuracy, so P is 0.95 with 20 kb insert. So 20 kb insert just to give you a rough idea, human genome is 3 into 10 raised to power 6 kb divided by 20 kb insert. So this comes out to be so 1.5 multiplied by 10 raised to power 5. This will be the n here based on the insert size. So for 95% accuracy with 20 KB insert, you will need to screen 420,000 different colonies. Okay, just to have 95% accuracy, there is still a 5% chance that you will just miss that. Okay, so that's why to increase the insert size is really a helpful measure because it really tears down the N. Right, and if you want 99% accuracy, see how the number jumps up to 650,000. That's six and a half lakh clones that you need to screen, right? Tremendous amount of, num uh, you know, tremendous amount of colonies and a lot of back breaking work. So anyways, this gives you an idea of how many clones you need to screen, usually with better insert sizes and more manageable genomes. For example, if you have a smaller yeast genome or even mouse genomes, but with larger insert size vectors, backs, yaks, packs, Right? So you can have much less number of clones that you need to screen. But this is a frequently asked question in, for example, CSIR net examination as well as DBT GRF examination. So you need to keep this equation in mind. I think they will not you know, ask you to perform this calculation because it of course involves natural log and you can't do it without a calculator. But there may be some time you, you never know with the examiner. Sometimes they push you to actually do that calculation by hand. Anyways. So how do you go about screening different colonies? So one of the first techniques was developed in 1975 by Michael Grunstein and David Hogness. And this is called the colony hybridization. And the technique is, 
I think conceptually, I think uh, pretty intuitive to understand. You can take a look here. It is almost self-explanatory. Okay, so you have your transformant colonies. This is the, for example, the the petri plate that we were just looking at before, the one containing the plasmids. Okay, with the E. coli clones, uh, E. coli colonies growing on them. We replica plate it to. Uh, we replica plate it. Okay, so we make a replica of it onto nitrocellulose disc placed on agar in petri plate. So we take a nitrocellulose disc, okay, and we take a, for example, an impression of it, and then we allow it to incubate. So it will grow the same pattern. So it will be a Xerox copy almost like of the original plate. Okay, so this is your master plate, and this is your replica plate. Okay, you remove the nitrocellulose disc now, so you are left with the colonies. And then first you lyse the bacteria using a very strong alkaline solution. So you burst open the cells, neutralize it with a lower pH buffer to make it neutral. Use proteinase treatment to, to get rid of the protein, wash and then bake it at 80 degrees Celsius to cross link the DNA to the nitrocellulose disc. Okay. And what you do now is you know the putative sequence or the important sequence of your gene and you make a probe out of it and you make a radioactive probe in the earlier days at least you had a p32 labeled probe you hybridize it with those you know dna fragments which are baked and then uh, imprinted onto nitrocellulose disc and you perform it autoradiography this will give you positive clone one or several different positive clones and those are the ones containing your gene of interest in the form of a colony okay? and then you can refer back to the master plate and then pick positive colony grow it and then analyze the clone right so that's the colony hybridization later on a similar technique was developed by benton and davis this is for plaques okay and, and basically uses the same exact methodology just a slight difference because these are plaques instead of plasmids so slightly different but overall the concept and the uh, you know the principle stays the same Another technique uh, that was developed by Rick Young, uh, then a postdoc in Stanford, now a professor at MIT and one of the established figures in uh, gene expression studies, and Ronald Davis, they used antibody probes for isolation of genes. So in this case, this is the schematic that we have from one of the perspective articles written by Harvey Lodish. Here we have the LAC promoter beta galactosidase which is the lac z and an eco r1 site you digest with eco r1 so this will disrupt the lac z open reading frame lac z will no longer be active you insert your cdna in this space okay so now the fusion protein is there okay with some lac z and then your cdna of interest Okay, then you plate it on bacterial lawn, you get your plaques. Then you overlay it with the nitrocellulose filter, remove the filter, again pretty much do the same thing. Now proteins which are synthesized and expressed by the bacteria, right? the fusion protein will also be synthesized by the bacteria, they will bind to the nitrocellulose. You are not interested in the uh, DNA fragments per se, but you are more interested in the proteins which are expressed because you are looking for uh, cdnas right and they are directly expressing your protein of interest and then you incubate it with primary antibody against your protein and and then incubate it with a radio labeled secondary antibody so this is iodine iodine 2125 labeled secondary antibody and this will give you an auto radiography signal okay and that's the uh, the basis of identifying genes by using antibody probes Right, so you can imagine it like this we have our antigen so that's the protein fusion protein or other proteins we have one igg molecule antibody and then we have the radioactive secondary antibody okay and then we can use antibody probes to identify positive clones okay and this is uh, the figure from the paper uh, here they have they are looking at the alpha amylase and ovalbumin clones 
right, two relatively very common proteins. And these are lambda GT11 vectors. So these are different colonies and these are the positive colonies which give the positive signal and then these can be further analyzed, you know, using plaques and these plaques can be grown and then protein can be harvested and analyzed. Okay, so this is the uh, principle behind using antibody probes. All right, another kind of very tricky and kind of looks pretty plausible technique is to use functional complementation. It looks like it may work or may not work. And actually it does kind of give sometimes mixed results depending upon how far the homologue of a protein is. But the idea here is you use E. coli, a mutant E. coli, and you use a gene from yeast, a putative gene, which basically rescues that phenotype from the E. coli if it is homologous to that gene. Okay, so for example, if you have an E. coli mutant, which has, for example, tryptophan gene mutated, so one of the tryptophan biosynthesis genes, trip A, B, C, whatever it is, okay, and you provide it with yeast cDNA, which encodes that trip A homolog, what you are looking for is complementation of the phenotype. So you are looking for rescuing of the phenotype. So it should be able to grow even in the absence of tryptophan, which should not happen for that mutant E. coli. So this was actually done. And here you are looking at the data from that paper. Uh, this is transformation of E. coli oxoprofs by yeast hybrid plasmids. So they used multiple yeast plasmids. These are leucine gene containing and you seen a histidine containing uh, cDNAs that they used and they transformed it into the alleles. These are E. coli alleles. So these are different mutant alleles. And then they are looking at whether they got Leu plus or His plus colony. So the colonies from Leu plus means they were able to grow without leucine. So leucine prototroph and histidine prototroph. So they are able to grow even without histidine or without leucine even though they don't have the gene and that only happened because this yeast gene was exactly homologous to the E. coli gene and this happened right so this happened for a couple of alleles as you can see in this case for leucine uh, leucine b6 this uh, cdna was able to rescue but not in this case in this case it was able to rescue but not in this case so it depends upon what kind of mutation it is and how it is able to rescue Okay. So this is another approach, functional complementation. So this, te this technique has also been utilized in mouse with success. So they have a wild type mouse here. So this is a normal mouse. They isolate the genomic DNA, made a back genomic library. So these are big insert genomic DNA libraries. And they have several back clones. And in this case, they are looking for a gene called Shaker2. So among all the uh, back clones that they have they are looking for the shaker 2 gene which is involved in neurological function and in the shaker 2 mouse this is the mutant mouse they got the homozygous shaker 2 eggs and what they do is they inject individual back clones so the idea is that the individual back clone if it contains that shaker 2 gene it should be able to complement it and it should be able to rescue the shaker 2 phenotype so they inject individual back clones and one particular back clone was able to identify was able to correct the defect so one particular individual back clone was able to correct the defect which is found in shaker 2 mouse right rest of the mice are still shaker to mutants okay now you can sequence them and then even screen human library using them and then you can map human gene with that right so pretty useful for gene mapping so these are some of the approaches that people have used in the past and they are still standard molecular biology techniques for screening genomic dna as well as cdna libraries so these are some of the standard techniques that people use have used in so these are some of the technical so these are some of the common techniques that people have used in the past and are still standard molecular biology techniques for screening human uh, so these are some of the common techniques that people have used in the past regarding screening of 
uh, genomic DNA libraries and cDNA libraries to fish their genes of interest, responsible for diseases, responsible for various biological processes. Okay, I hope you like this discussion. If you have any doubts, comments or questions, please give them in the comment section below. I would love to receive any feedback from you. Thank you for watching and I will see you next time.